really, the, tonight's message is, is not again about being fearful. It's, being like not, and for, it's more about being aware. As a matter of fact, tonight, <laughs> it will be the first time that this church has gone through two chapters, not two verses, two chapters in 30 minutes. Yeah, we're going through two chapters of the book of Matthew in 30 minutes, two whole chapters. And I'm gonna make it so exciting, you won't know you've gone through two chapters. I, I, it, and, and the truth is, it's really gonna be Jesus preaching to you. Because I'm just gonna repeat what Jesus preached. Right through Matthew, He just preaches and preaches and preaches. And I'm just gonna do that tonight. I'm gonna let Jesus preach to you tonight. Um, uh, the end will come, be assured of that. But my heart tonight is the end of the age will come, but until then, but until then, we should be found doing what the Father's called us to do. And that's to love this world, love the people of our planet, to bring the wonder of God and of Jesus to the generation we live in. Let's start with uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse three. And um, this is Jesus and the disciples. Now He, he sat on the Mount of Olives, Olives and uh, the disciples came to Him privately saying, Jesus, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. He sits, they sit down and go, oh, come on, tell us, tell us what's going on here. What are the signs when you're coming back? What are the signs of the end of the age? What's it going to look like? How, how will we know that it's gonna be the end? And uh, I wanna tell you today that we are a lot closer today to the end of the age than they were 2000 years ago. And I'm not saying it's imminent. I'm, I don't say it's this week or next week or, or next month. I don't know when it's gonna be. And the Bible speaks very clearly about we will not know the hour of the day. But there's no doubt that 2000 years have passed and we are closer to the end of the age than we ever have been before. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we're a lot closer than they were then. So Jesus responds and He starts to tell or prophesy. Um, uh, and as a matter of fact, it's interesting because He prophesies about two events in the same prophetic word. And he intermingles the two because he knows that one is imminent and the one is a long way down the track. Yet the signs of both of these events are the same. He wants them to be clear that something imminent is about to happen that will change the age. And then he wants them to know that way down the track at the end, there's gonna be an end of the age and he will return. And the things that go on then and now will be the same. And what happens back in the day is that 70 years after Jesus speaks these words, uh, Titus or the, uh, the, um, the Roman general Titus goes into into Jerusalem and he doesn't just kill all the people, he destroys Jerusalem. It was known as the, de the destruction of Jerusalem. 70 years after Jesus prophesied, He was saying, there will be an end of the age soon. It's imminent, but then there'll be the end of the age when I will return, all right? So that's how He starts the conversation. So let's have a look at Matthew 24, verse four through 14. And it says this, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in My Name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, or nationality will rise against nationality, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, or uh, plagues, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver. Now he speaks really to the 70 year destruction. Oh, the, the, the destruction of Jerusalem which happens in 70 years. They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. And he says, that's what's gonna happen soon, but also in the end times, that's gonna take place. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But listen to this, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. You know, I, as I read that, I just think, what a shame it's got to end like that. How sad that, that there's a sense of, that, that the Bible doesn't declare at some stage that humanity suddenly the light switches on, they glorify God, accept Jesus and the world is saved. That's how I like the end to happen. But Jesus is not saying that. He's saying that people will not get better. They will grow colder in the last days. 
Not, not us, but people will. And, and he was saying that there's gonna be these times where people are gonna start to wonder why they're doing what they're doing and it's not a great outcome. And I know that in saying that, that doesn't exclude what God's gonna do right here in this dark place. Don't, don't, be, don't be afraid like it's all gloom and doom. No, God's gonna show up and show off. There are gonna be revival after revival after revival. There'll be millions of people get saved. But this, this is not a time where we go, oh, well, just it's all over. That's not true at all. He's just saying, look at the times we're moving into as we get closer to the age ahead. So important we understand the times that we live in. It's so, it's so, men back in the day, and we'll speak a bit more about it later, back in the day decided he could do better without God. He turned his back, mankind turned their back on God and said, we don't need you and we've got this, thank you very much. And I look around the planet and we're 2,000 years down the track and I'm thinking, how has that all worked out? That really hasn't gone according to what people's plan thought it would come to. Man, are not as smart as he thinks he really is. And it's funny how when tragedy or disaster strikes, whether it's an earthquake or a horrible murder or the death of a loved one, the question that rattles people's brains is why does God allow these things to happen? Some even blame God. They point the finger, this is all your fault. You did this. I, I even find it interesting that when people hit their thumb with a hammer, it's not, oh, Muhammad. Oh, Buddha. It's always, oh, Jesus. I find that there's this, there's this intuitive battle in people for truth because they've almost said to themselves that God doesn't care. And the truth is God doesn't cause our pain and He doesn't even allow our pain. The disasters we see happen on this planet are not God's fault. If you went to the Minister of Transport and said, why do you allow these horrible accidents to happen on our roads? You'd probably get a fairly clear response of me, allow, I don't allow. There are rules and principles in place and if people followed them, we would ha wouldn't have these tragedies on our roads. You see, God designed a system that if mankind followed, our world would be a completely different place. It's not God did not do this. He did not cause it. He did not allow that. He let man do what he wanted. I mean, blaming God for our mess is like blaming McDonald's for making you fat. It's not McDonald's fault. You can blame them all you want, but it's not McDonald's fault. There's a sense of a lack of personal responsibility that happens at that level, but also in the spiritual realm where we take no responsibility for what we've caused on the planet. God does not allow and He does not, he does not cause the pain and mess that we experience as human beings in our world. It's not McDonald's fault and it's not God's fault. As a matter of fact, I know this, that God's greatest judgment on humankind is not punishment, it's just to let us do what we want. His greatest judgment is to say, you know what? You don't want me, then do it yourself. And that's where we live in a world like now. We live in this place on earth that we're so smart in some things, yet we can't even get on with one another because we've decided to do life without the plan of God for our lives. Look at Romans chapter one, verse 20. It says, since, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by all the things that are made, even His external power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse because although they knew God, they did not glorify God. This is people in general. Nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise or wiser than God and mankind has become fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image they made God's, instead of worshipping the God, all right, they made gods, uh, uh, corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. They designed gods that they would worship instead. Therefore, verse 24, this is the judgment of God on us. Therefore, God also gave them over up to uncleanliness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonour their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, worshipped the, and served the creature rather than Creator who blessed them forever. Very clearly right there, God says, I let them do what they want. If you wanna run the world without me, go ahead and look what has taken place since. This is the world that we live in. In um, verse 26 here, I'd like you to read it from the screen 
And uh, then we'll move on to verse 28, but verse 26 and 27. If you could just read that, uh, that would be great. In verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which were not fitting, being filled with unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. Is that how you say it? Yeah, good enough. Maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, uh, un- undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving and unmerciful. I-, I don't know what world you live in that sounds like mine. It sounds like a world without God. It sounds like a world without God. God gave them over to their own desires. He let them do what they want. God does not delight in or cause the mess on our planet. He is saddened by it. And Jesus and His church are His answers to bring hope, healing, breakthrough and salvation to all people. That's God's plan to bring light into a dark world. That's why we're gonna see a move of God so strong, so bright. as, As the age gets closer to the end, the glory of God becomes greater and greater and greater. For as the darkness rises, God says the light gets brighter. So I expect God to see, see incredible things in these years to come. So back to Jesus, He answers to the disciples. He's saying this, this the, the mess, this, the tragedies, the upheaval, they're all increasing. The, the, the planet is shifting and moving. Things are, are getting crazier because we're getting closer to the end. You see, what's happening really is the weight of sin is having its due effect on the planet and the people. It's having, it's finally the load's too much for all that's around us and it's having due effect. That's why he talks about wars and rumours of wars. In my wildest dreams that I would think I would wake up in 2022 and see a war through one of the greatest communist nations against a democracy next to it. We were a civilised world a few years ago, most of it, not all of it, most of it, but we live in a place now where there's wars and rumours of wars. We live in a day where uh, there's nation against nation, nationality against nationality. Uh, we live in a, in a day where wars are not fought on battlefields, but in an age of terrorism. We, we, we're, we're looking in a place where earthquake and global uh, weather events are becoming a little bit more outrageous and shifting. And it's all what Jesus said, pa- pestilence or what we'd call today pandemics. And uh, uh, you know, the only question I have about that pandemic was it, was it on purpose or was it leaked? That's all I have. I don't know whether it was a test run for the future or whether it was a terrible accident. I'm not sure. But Jesus spoke about pestilence or pandemics back in the day. Let's read on. In uh, verse 15, 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So he's talking about Jerusalem, AD 70 again, where the destruction of Jerusalem happens. In Judea, flee to the mountains and let them who is in the housetop not go down and take anything out of his house and let him who is in the field not go back and get his clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant in those days and nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation. Now we're going back into the end. There'll be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall ever be. And unless those days are shortened, no flesh would be saved for the sake of those days, for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. An incredible passage of Scripture, I'll I'll go on, and uh, will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive the apostle, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, here in the desert, do not go out there. Look, he's in the inner room, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. He, um, 
He describes right at the end, he describes now the, the, the last era of the, e, the age here and what we call the Great Tribulation. And uh, many believers have qualms over the Great Tribulation. Uh, some people believe Jesus is going to come back before, some mid, some post. And so we have the pre, the mid and the post. I'm more of a pan person. That means a little pan out in the end. When He comes back is fine with me. Uh, I'm not going to get into quarrels over whether it's pre or mid or post. I'm pan. Jesus has got this under control. I'm all good with His return. Um, but it says, The Son of Man, Jesus, will be seen by all the earth. All nations will gather and see. He will gather His people up and from heaven and earth and a new age will begin. And I've always wondered how the whole earth could see Jesus arrive at the same time. And maybe it's just an event that's got so many layers and levels that the whole world sees Jesus come. Or maybe we just live in a day with phones. And then in an instant, the whole world sees the return of Christ. I don't know which one it is, but it does say that the whole world will see His return. And there's no doubt when we look around Either be social media, or news channels, or whatever. We live in strange days, and the days get stranger. <laughs> I remember a few years ago, Lee was really caught up in the news a bit, and she was really wanting to find out what's happening in the world. And she would uh, go to sleep watching news channels, and uh, and of course she'd fall asleep. The TV would go all night, and I'd fall asleep because I, I wasn't interested at all in the news. And and uh, but what happened was I'd wake up in the morning and I turned the news on, and I'd go, I knew that. I, I thought I had a prophetic gift coming on my life. I know that, I know that, but it was just in my head while I was sleeping. All around us, world events suggest we're getting closer to the end of the age. Who knew, <laughs> who knew we could invent so many ways to wipe ourselves out? Not, not back 2,000 years ago, you couldn't wipe yourself out. You could have fights against somebody. You had swords or bows or arrows and it got to bullets and tanks and missiles. But now, 2,000 years later, we have nuclear weapons. We, no, we have chemical weapons. Oh, hang on. We've got disease weapons. And it goes, the list goes on and on. Never in human history has there been a time where we can wipe each other out which again doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's just another sign we're getting closer to the end of the age. We've become so smart. At the same time, so fragile. We have smartphones, the cloud, tap and go. I've got a watch that I can, I, my, and I bought this watch because I can make a phone call while I'm in the surf. As a matter of fact, if Lee, my wife, rings me while I'm in the surf, I can take a call. Not that I would, but I could. I, I mean, that's incredible. One of my, when I was a child, one of my heroes on TV was a guy called Dick Tracy. And it was a cartoon back in the 60s. And his superpower was that he had a watch he could talk through. That was his superpower. Calling go, 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 Maz, this is Dick Tracy. I mean, that was the story. And here it is, I've got one. I'm so excited. <laughs> We're so smart, but if we lose power for 14 days, we're done. Once your phone runs out and you can't charge it, you're done. You, you can't go to a, an ATM machine and get money out because they're not on. You can't use your card at Coles or Woolworths because it's not working. They've taken all of our cash off us. So now it's harder than ever to do things that are besides electronically. You need a phone or an iPad or an iChip or something to do anything you want. And within 14 days of no power, the world goes into chaos. It shuts down. Planes start falling out of the sky. But well, they can't even get up in the sky to start with. There's a there's sense that we're so smart, but we're not so smart. We are so fragile in the sense of what's taking place around us. We live in a day where things that were wrong are now right. And things that were right are now wrong. The church, the Christians, though <laughs> we do more for the world in social justice, aid, care, 
food, education, hospitalization, and education than anybody else in the world. We are classified as bigots if we don't agree with social trends of the day that oppose biblical values. We are, we are, we are classed as people that are unforgiving, yet, man, and I find everybody else is allowed to have their opinion and perspective except for believers. And yet we are the most accepting group of people on the planet. Jesus said that, He said, come as you are. And since we follow Jesus, that's our expression to everybody. Come as you are. We are the most embracing group of people. We have compassion, though we don't have to have compromise. We can have acceptance without having to agree. Jesus said, come as you are. And yet we're classified as bigots because we stand by biblical values that have started and founded civilization for the last 200 years. And without that, we were back to chaos and mayhem. Before Christian, Christian Judeo foundations and principles were in place, it was the strongest country ruled the world. And then we had a revival, a move of God that so changed destiny for such a long time. We have democracies and now we stand in a, a precipice of what the future looks like as democracy is somewhat losing its power in the place and Christianity is somewhat shunned as something that is no longer needed. Jesus said, come as you are. We are to have compassion without compromise. Acceptance without agreeance. All the signs are here but nobody knows the day. Nobody knows it. No one's, the Bible says no one knows the hour or the day. We just know it's moving in that general direction. So what do we do? Let's go to verse 36. Matthew, you all good? It's not boring, is it? It's really good. I'm good at this. I mean, two chapters in 30 minutes, that says you're reading the Bible for the next two months. You're ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But of that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah, we also will be like the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, there was eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the Son of Man be like that. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. And <laughs> I remember, <laughs> it reminds me of the movies in the 80s. What was it, Mike? The, huh? Left behind. left behind. I still remember that. About the rapture. In the movie, we'd have this guy this woman coming to find her husband and she goes into the bathroom and his electric shaver is there by itself and it's going. And she says, I've been left behind. <laughs> Great movies. You need to see those movies. They, we used to show them in the park to people. It, it freaked people out. It's like being left behind. In the field taken, two women grinding the mill be taken, the other left. Therefore watch, for you do not know what the hour of the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known the hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also, talking to us, be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. In other words, even though we don't know the timing of it, the plan of God is we're about the Father's business till He comes back. We're to, we're to be ready for this. We are to be we're to live ready for this, all right? Uh, to keep your heart right, um, to know what God's called us to do. Uh, the end will come, but don't worry about it. Get on with life. Be about the business of being a great Christian. And that's, that's how you live ready for this end time process when you don't know what's going on. And people say, what about the, the battle of Armageddon? And there is a, there is a, a battle described in the Bible called Armageddon, where I believe a third of all mankind perishes in. Uh, and that's someday in the future. But you know what I've learned? I've learned not to waste my energy on things I have nothing I can change. Nothing I can do anything about. 
I can't change that. I don't know how it's gonna come. I don't know what's gonna take place. I've got no power to change that future. But what I wanna do is have my strength and my wits about me to change what I can change. Because I do know this, that today was somebody's Armageddon. Somebody today got told they've got an incurable disease. Somebody today could have died in a car accident. There are people every day going through their own personal Armageddon. And that's where we have the power to change, to bring healing, to bring hope, to bring future into people's lives. We don't have to worry about the Armageddon. Let's be about Armageddon right here, right now. Let's be about what we can change, where we can make a difference, what God has called us to. Matthew 24, verse 45. And this speaks about this. Again, this is just Jesus. I'm just preaching, Jesus, just saying what Jesus said. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him doing so. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delayed coming back, all right? He's delayed coming back, all right? Um, and he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day where he is not looking for him at an hour he does not aware of and will cut him in, <laughs> and will cut him in two and appoint him in, uh, his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Keep your heart right. Be about the Father's business. This is not about cramming near the end to get through the exam. This is about living the right life all the way through. We're not found thinking, well, he's not going to come back for a while. We're going to just go out and be stupid and do stupid things. No, it says, be about the Father's business while you're here. In the last, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. And the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to 10 virgins who took their lambs and went to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were wise, five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lambs and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lambs. But while the bridegroom delayed, they slumbered and slept. At midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom coming goes to meet them. And all those virgins arose and trimmed the lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give me some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, no, lest it should be not enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy, buy it yourselves. And while they were out buying, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him to be the wedding and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, As surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you neither know the day or the hour where the Son of Man is coming back. A very clear message that wise people are about the Father's business. Every time you see oil written in the New Testament, it talks about the anointing and the purposes of God. These five wise are out there being and doing what God called them to do just doing their stuff. The five that were foolish had not been about doing that stuff. And when they realised it was almost imminent, they all got freaked out, decided to run out and try and buy that oil, but they missed their opportunity. What I'm saying in this tonight is that I know the end will come, but God's saying, until then, be about the Father's business. That's what it's about. Be about the Father's business. 25 verses, four, we're almost done. 25, 14 through 30. And the kingdom of heaven is like a man travelling. I'm just going to, I just know this one off by heart. There's a king and he's about to go travelling. He's got servants. He gives a servant five talents. He gives another servant two talents and he gives another servant one talent. And he says, I'm going away, but I'm coming back. So this is what you got to remember. He's gone away, but he's coming back. But I'm going to give you something to do while I'm here. Eventually the king comes back and the guy that got five talents had invested the five and made five more. The guy that had, had two talents invested the two talents and got two more. The guy that was given the one talent didn't like the king that much, was lazy and he hid the talent and did nothing with it. The king gets back. He says to the guy with five, now 10, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. The guy with two who has now four, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. He looks at the guy that had one and he doesn't say, well done, you didn't break it. You didn't lose it, you didn't steal it. He said, you are a wicked servant. You did not do what I asked you to do while I was away. And he says, the Bible says he was cast out to a place where there's weeping and ganashing of teeth. You never wanna go where there's ganashing of teeth. 
The word faithful in the Bible means fruitful. So when God says, well done, good and faithful servant, He's not saying, oh, you turned up. He's saying, you did something with what I gave you to do. So God has given us, I said earlier, given us gifts and abilities. He's given us, He wants an investment on that. He wants to come back and we've done something for the Kingdom of God. He's looking for people that have said, you know what, I'm in. I want to do that. And the last Scripture tonight, we will get through, is Matthew 25, verse 31 through 40. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, He will sit on the throne of His glory and the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them from one another as the shepherd divides his sheep and from the goats. He will set the sheep on His right hand and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you bless my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous answered him and said, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty or give you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in? When, when were you naked? Do we put clothes on you? When did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? And the king answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you as much as you've done it to one of the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. And there's a true picture of God saying to us, the end will come. But until then, let's be about the Father's business. Let's bring heaven to earth. Heaven, the Kingdom of God is both power and love. We are to love the people around us. We're to help them all they can. We're to encourage them. We're to pray them. We're to bless the hungry. We're to set the captives free. The end will come, but don't worry about it. Until then, let's be about the Father's business. The hour will come. No one knows. Let's be about the Father's business. We bow heads, close your eyes tonight. Father, I thank You for every believer here tonight. God, I thank You that I, well, I pray, Lord, that in this moment, something supernatural will speak into their hearts about the days that we live in. Not that we faint away from the times, but to be excited about the God we serve and the opportunities ahead. We will bring light and life into the generation around us. God has promised, who can stand against us if You be for us? And I thank You right now that Lord, as we get prepared for the great days ahead, the great revival, the great move of God in the future, from church to church, from state to state, from nation to nation, that we'll see the light of God shine brighter than we've seen it for a thousand years or so. God, we thank You for opportunity. I pray God, blessing over these ones today. And with eyes closed and heads bowed. I spoke a lot about the end times, but the reality is that God's really interested in you. He designed and created you. The good news is tonight, it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been, He's not angry at you, He's not mad at you. Tonight's message is to prepare you for the future a little bit. But the way we start preparation for now, the future and eternity, the Bible says, is by believing upon Jesus. And tonight you might never have made that decision to believe upon Jesus. It will change not some of your world, it will change all of your world. I don't know what challenges or problems you're facing right now or which ones are in your future, but I do know this. The answer you're gonna need will start and finish in the Name of Jesus. God's looking at you, He's watching you. He's wanting you to say yes tonight. He wants the very best for your life. He'll forgive you of every sin, every mistake. He won't even remember him again. He's not against us, He loves us. Jesus come not to condemn the world, but through Him that we might be saved. Saved out of whatever, saved out of our past, saved out of the mess it could have been. I'm not gonna embarrass you tonight, but I'd love to pray with you. If that's you tonight and you say, you know what, I, I, I wanna believe upon Jesus, or maybe it's, I need to recommit my life. I, I've been away from God and tonight's message has, has spoken the truth back into my heart about the reality of who He is. And I, I wanna recommit and say yes to Him again. Or maybe you just wanna make sure your eternity is all in good condition, that you're right with God. So right now, I'm gonna look, and if that, you're one of those three types of people, I'm gonna pray with you right where you're seated. I'd love you to raise your hand right now. Right now, just raise your hand. Give me a wave and say, you know what? Pray with me tonight. Include me in this prayer. 
I want to know Jesus tonight. Thank you right on the side. That's a great decision over there tonight. Others tonight, if that's you, slip your hand up, give me a wave. We're about to pray. Thank you at the back. That's a great decision. Thank you on the side. That's another great decision there. God sees not just hands, He sees hearts. So look one more time from front to back, from left to right. If that's you, say, you know what, include me today. Pray with me today. Pray, I'm coming to Jesus right now. Would you just lift your hand one more? Just lift it up. I haven't seen it already. And say, yeah, include me tonight. Lord, I thank You for those hands that went up, but You're more powerfully not seeing them. You're seeing the hearts that opened up. And now a miracle starts to unfold. Heaven comes to their heart and we are born again or made alive to God. You're going to love us so tightly and completely that we become children, sons, daughters of the Most High God. God, I pray blessing on each of these people tonight. Have Your way. Let this be the beginning of an incredible adventure in Christ with Jesus tonight. And I know heaven rejoices for every one of these. And so do we here at City Point Church. In Jesus' Name. And all that agreed said, Amen. Let's give it up for all those great people tonight.